Howard School. Well, it's supposed to be debated at the Howard School, but this is a super panel. You don't want to hear a, a whole paper on the fate of the Howard School. That would take way too long. So I thought what I would do instead is just, I, I'm, you know, I'm thankful that we're having this event. It's kind of a dream come true. Um, and I think I'm, in, in, a, in a little way, a libel for it. If you, look at the, if you look at the text that talks about recovering this kind of work on race and imperialism in the 1930s and 40s, etc., um, I've been putting that forward in a book that I've just finished. It's called, uh, right now, it's called, you tell me if I should change it, A Black World Order of White Power Politics. And it's really a history of international relations in the United States. And uh, But it's a history unlike anyone's ever told. And I, I, and I present in that what I call the Howard School of, of, of IR theory. So that's slightly different from Christopher's formulation, the Howard School, recovering the Howard School of International Affairs, and that conveys something slightly different. Charles Henry actually originated the idea of a Howard School, I think he called it Howard School of Race. Um, and uh, so I'm indebted to him. And, and I'll get to the difference in a minute. But I thought the better thing to do, rather than talking about the end of the Howard School, is to make the case briefly <coughs> for seeing the work of Elaine Locke, Ralph Bunch, Eric Williams, uh, Frank Frazier, Rayford Logan, Merz Tate in New Light, or in Tate's case, uh, really for the first time, as just been described. She has not really talked about much in political science literature to this point. But, so in order to see this, we have to talk about an intellectual problem, and that is that we're, we're trapped by what a, a far better than my colleague in history, Bruce Kuglick, calls um, practitioner histories. We're all trapped to the extent that we're intellectuals in, in practitioner histories. Uh, Kuglick, by the way, um, was one of the published with Murray's Tate once in the Encyclopedia on Foreign Relations, and she went really to her grave being very proud of her contribution to that encyclopedia, one of the only women, one of the only African Americans actually published in that. But um, um, so what these practitioner histories are, the histories disciplines tell about themselves. So now the disciplines I'm interested in are, on the one hand, international relations, and by the way, I'm a recovering Middle East expert, so uh, I'm not part of any of these things. Uh, um, um, there's a history of international relations on the one hand, and the history of Africa, and, and the, the discipline of African American studies on the other. Now, juxtaposing these two in particular presents an additional problem because today, for me at least, it's hard to imagine two fields in the humanistic sciences more isolated from one another than these two. IR on the one hand and Afro-American studies. As the IR professors tell the graduate students and the graduate students tell the undergrads, IR is an intellectual tradition going back to the ancient Greek uh, scholar Thucydides concerned with the relations among states. Um, go back to Krista's flyer and she talks about the nexus of race and empire uh, in world politics in the 30s and 40s and an IR professor today would say neither of those terms, race nor empire, have anything to do with what we study. We study, we study the international state system under, un, under uh, uh, conditions of anarchy. Uh, and as one of the leaders of the field explained to me a little while ago, we don't teach Du Bois because he never wrote anything in the field. Now, yet W.E.B. Du Bois was on the board of editors of the country's first IR journal. It was called the Journal of Race Development. And he continued to publish in that journal when it took a new name under a partial new set of principles. We know it now as foreign affairs. And we'll come back to this. That's the IR side, then, in a nutshell, where, where it is only black professors, as far as I can see, who teach Du Bois in courses in international relations, as far as I've been able to determine. But let's consider Afro Lamb then for a second. Now, I trust some of you know the origin stories, or perhaps you teach the origin stories in your own classes. So I will go into that. Let's, I'm concerned, let's just imagine the canon today in Afro Am. And what's interesting to me today is the canon is more Toni Morrison and Lorraine Hansberry, let's say, than uh, a bunch and locks of student George Padmore, where Padmore was once read in, 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 in the field. And I'm still in Afro Am, you're But so, in, in the point is that the, the distance wasn't as great in the first 10 years of black studies 
the distance with our international relations as it is now 30 or 40 years into the future. But so let me give you another example of that. Consider that none of today's premier public intellectuals and leaders in the discipline that Du Bois is said to have inspired, whether it's Kwame Appian, Michael Eric Dyson, Henry Louis Gates, Henry Louis Gates Cornell West, none writes for foreign affairs. That's not a criticism, it's a data point that helps explain the large gaps in the posthumously revised curricula vita of the members of the Howard School. So, the case for seeing the Howard professors as a school of IR theory, and I can only begin to make the case here, requires us to uh, um, get away, to, to break free of what is, all, what is our collective common sense of how we think about world politics today, which, which is, in fact, a legacy of the Cold War. The dissemination of ideas about national security and the like, right? Even in, even if you've never taken an IR class, you actually think like an IR professor today. So now, why do we have to rethink this in a way? Well, because the, the term international relations, when first used to define an emerging field of knowledge back around 1900, 1910 or so, basically meant race relations. These were synonyms. International relations and race relations were the same thing. It was the study of the causes and consequences of the encounter between the different higher and lower races. So IR textbooks in the 1920s discussed miscegenation as a phenomenon. Uh, trust me, that's not discussed in IR textbooks in 2000. <laughs> and the Harlem Renaissance was of particular concern in the IR textbooks in the 1920s. And you're supposed to say to me, what do you mean Harlem? That's this place, this country, international relations is out there. But no, Harlem, the Harlem Renaissance or Harlem was of particular concern because it seemed to represent an instance of rising consciousness among, among those subject to the effects of the encounter with what was called at the time the restless Caucasian energies that had brought erstwhile distant lands and races into increasing contact. We have the field of IR emerges with the invention of something called the theory of race development, as the first IR journal put it. And that especially was there both to describe a predictable consequence of this process, the encounter of races. You get naturally race development, was this controversial offering of the professors at the time. And race development in turn was seen as offering possible solutions to the threat of conflict that seemed in the offing. Okay, conflict that seems in the offing. Now that seems like international relations, right? But it's what the professors at the time called race war. Their predictions about race war, a term in continued play in the culture of the United States through the 1960s, by the way. So if, if, if so, then, if you, if you follow what I'm saying in, in such a short-handed way, then what is unique about the Howard School of Thinkers, the first black faculty trained in and teaching international relations in the, it, 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 they are the first black faculty doing this and training it and, and teaching it is their early and relentless critiques of the supposed truths of racial science of which race development theory were a part and of the role racism played in sustaining imperialism. Okay, so that's one of the things that, 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 that links them together. And they stand out as well for the connections they forged. Uh, 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 I'll just say this. For the connections they forged, unique among the generations of professors in international relations, to who? Not to the institutions of Geneva, not to smuts, etc., but to the theoret theoreticians of liberation and the future leaders of Africa and the island nations of the Caribbean. So think again about Bunch, uh, Elaine Locke, uh, uh, in his support of George Patmore, and, and we can go on and on from there, think about Eric Williams, etc. I argue that what unites the otherwise different projects of these thinkers is the commitment unique at the time to understanding and writing about white world supremacy from the standpoint of its victims. Okay. So let me finish by noting how an account like this kind of resolves some puzzles in the existing practitioner histories of Afro-American studies. I'll leave by art to the side for a second. If you read the Harrison Molesworth biography of Elaine Locke, 
you will see them repeatedly putting the phrase race development in quotes, as if slightly mystified by this anachronistic usage. And they don't do it once they use it, they do it three times in, in three pages. So they just really don't, they don't really explain what this race development is. But I invite you to go back to Locke's amazing 1915 and 1916 lectures on interracial relations, the one Howard's white administration banned him originally from giving, and see how engaged they are, because he produces his syllabus, for, or his reading list for those lectures, and they all come out of the Journal of Race Development, and they come out of the Universal Races Congress in 1911, and they were fundamentally concerned with interracial or international relations as it was understood at the time, in dialogue with every white professor writing, writing in the field at that moment. This new science of international slash interracial relations. Or consider some of the difficulties. It's been quite hard to take bunches intellectual project and make sense of it coherently, right? So, it, so as, as both Charles Henry and Pearl Robinson have, have, have tried to do. So one, one way you, one might describe him as an eclectic thinker working both on domestic and foreign affairs. That is certainly the categorization we would use now. Bunch wrote with uh, Gunnar Myrdal on the one hand and traveled in South Africa on the other, retrained in anthropology on the other. It sounds like he's dealing with the domestic world in the international world. Okay. Or Pearl, or seeing Bunch as the precursor to a field waiting to be born, African studies. Pearl Robinson describes it as, as a budding Africanist. But this characterization can't explain his knowledge of Indonesia and how he came this close to quitting government and joining the research staff of the Institute of Pacific Relations, having nothing to do with Africa. Bunch, it turns out, was a specialist in colonial administration. This was a, a specialization you trained in, studied in, got examined in at Harvard in the 1920s. It was what international relations was for, for, uh, for the white universities at the time, colonial administration. Okay. It's a specialization um, 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 that ostensibly offered lessons for the U.S. South, just as the U.S. South ostensibly offered lessons uh, uh, for African colonies. All these were seen as interchangeable at the time. So now you know about Bunch was that he became increasingly critical of some of this dogma, this assumption that everywhere it looks the same, but it was certainly, it was certainly the common knowledge of the field as it was emerging. And finally, I think by, uh, 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 by, by uh, this, this re reconfiguring our, our views of the moment, it allows us to bring Tate, who is otherwise such an outlier, right? And again, not, not coincidentally unknown in Afro-American studies until Bob Barker's work in the project. It allows us to understand Tate's projects, particularly the uh, 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 emerging analyses of imperialism in uh, um, um, uh, the Pacific, which, even though IR was born in the study of race and imperialism, by the 1960s, the discipline had rejected imperialism. You couldn't talk about imperialism anymore. You couldn't talk about an American empire anymore. And when Tate tried to publish her works on, uh, on imperialism in the Pacific, her own um, uh, ex-advisor uh, confidently you know, uh, 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 counsel uh, the, the publishers not to bother to publish the book not to, and not to fund the project because IR was not very interested at this moment in something called imperialism because this was, it was the heart of the Cold War. So as Tate, as Tate is like kind of pursuing the kinds of research projects that motivated Logan, Bunch, and the other, and, and the other scholars at the time, the, the discipline itself had, to, had turned against us. So yes, she's recognized as a diplomatic historian in some sense, but it's not what political science is doing. Now, political science, if you ask them today, they would have, or I'd show you books in the 1980s that say empire and imperialism are not what have never been words for scholars in the discipline of political science. And that, that's patently untrue with born in that uh, 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 the problematic, if you want. So thank you. Our next presenter will be Professor Pearl Robinson from Tufts University. Her paper is titled UN Trusteeship and Howard University Conference on Trust and Non-Self-Governing Territories, 1937 Conference. 